steps will follow. With all honesty, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom serves as quite a befitting conclusion to Arthur Curry's journey as the Atlantean King in the DC Extended Universe, effectively closing the chapter before James Gunn's upcoming DCU reboot in 2024. Directed by James Wan and written by David Leslie Johnson and the Goldrick, the second Aquaman film faced many challenges with its extensive reshoots in order to align itself with the broader DCU cinematic and TV slate. Despite initial setbacks in terms of bad publicity, scandal, and marketing issues, the sequel to 2018's Aquaman stands on its own merits as a solid addition to the DC Cinematic Universe. In its two-hour runtime, Aquaman 2 navigates through a complex narrative, addressing some ideas in depth while leaving others at the periphery as family, ecology, and forgiveness take center stage, with other thinly veiled allegories touching on contemporary political issues in the United States. We're talking about hostile government councils underwater, xenophobia, and glimpses of the ongoing culture war providing a backdrop. Although the film did choose to prioritize a character-driven plot over delving into prickly political terrain, it even explored the idea of global warming and handled it with surprising sensitivity as the Atlanteans grappled with the consequences of a rapidly changing climate influenced in part by Black Manta's actions. Most importantly, the film voice portraying them as helpless victims, introducing a sense of moral ambiguity and a connection to a relatable human experience. I guess by now you have understood that this video is a spoiler-ridden territory as we will be building up to explore the ending of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, so my friends, you have been warned. Now without wasting another moment, let's get right into it. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. What is the core premise of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom? In 2018's Aquaman, Arthur Curry had faced many daunting adversaries, but one of them was David Kane, who sought vengeance for the death of his father at Arthur's hands. Back then, the post credit scene hinted at Black Manta's emergence as a major threat in the next sequel, and that promise has been fulfilled in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. The sequel picks up with Arthur and Mira happily married, ruling Atlantis and enjoying domestic bliss after the events of the first film as Arthur raises his son with his father on the surface level. However, their idyllic life is disrupted when Kane acquires the Black Trident, posing a serious threat to everything Arthur holds dear. Kane is ready to do just about anything to avenge his father's death and goes on to employ a scientist to locate the much-needed power to level up his Black Manta suit. That would finally give him the ability to face Aquaman and basically take away everything that Arthur ever held dear. Basically, Black Manta is the primary villain in the film, as the central plot revolves around his quest to unravel the mysteries of the fabled Lost Kingdom. After he discovers the Black Trident, Black Manta finds it in two separate pieces under the ocean's unfathomable depth. Once he joins the Trident, it is almost as if something evil possessed him, sending him into a trance. This powerful artifact actually houses the spirit of King Kordax, the brother of King Atlan. Apparently, Kordax went mad with power and turned his entire kingdom into an army of evil monsters hell-bent on destruction, but King Atlan and his army intervened right on time to defeat the seventh kingdom of Necris and freeze it for all eternity with the use of his blood. Following Kordax's defeat, Atlan, in an act of retribution, concealed Necris beneath the frozen caps of Antarctica, which made sense why the film is titled The Lost Kingdom. Unraveling this historical enigma becomes the crux of Black Manta's mission, setting the stage for a compelling narrative as the characters navigate through the layers of Atlantean history and rivalry. Intriguingly, Kordax makes a compelling pitch to Black Manta and promises to imbue him with unimaginable power, which would give him the opportunity to seek his revenge against Aquaman. Now the condition is clear. Black Manta must locate the lost kingdom of Necris and lift the curse imposed on it by King Atlan, returning Kordax and his kingdom to its former glory. When Aquaman recognizes his limitations in dealing with this ancient technology, he seeks out his imprisoned half-brother Orm, enlisting him in a buddy cop-style adventure in order to thwart Kane's destructive plans. The narrative takes the audience on a thrilling journey through deep sea landscapes, a mutant jungle, a desolate desert, and ultimately to Antarctica. While Aquaman is pitted against a possessed Black Manta, the plot features elements like light necromancy, sonic death guns, and even a cephalophod sidekick. The adventure is both expansive and climatic, providing a sense of finality not just for Arthur Curry, but potentially signaling a conclusion to the entire DC Comics on-screen universe as we have known it. 
The plot somehow turns into a sappy reunion of two estranged brothers. Despite the events of 2018's Aquaman, Arthur harbors no resentment towards his half-brother Orm. Now, the film does not shy away from highlighting how their upbringing differs significantly, as Arthur was never raised with the same ingrained hatred instilled in Orm by their father, Orvax. Even if it is because of his ulterior motive, Arthur intervenes to rescue Orm from the harsh treatment he endures in prison, leading Orm to reconsider his perspective on his brother. Though Orm may detest being labeled as little brother by Arthur, their relationship eventually repairs across the initial acts of the sequel through emotional moments or making hilarious core memories that allows them a chance to bond like true brothers. As Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom steadily unveils the identity of the entity possessing David Kane, Atlanta reveals that it was not magic but DNA that sealed the King of Necris. This meant that the only way to free the Lost Kingdom was to use the blood of Arthur, Orm, or Atlanta. But soon, the aquatic crew realizes that the most probable target in Black Manta's plan was actually their baby boy Arthur Curry Jr. The film further intensifies the stakes as Black Manta kidnaps Arthur's son after stabbing Tom, Arthur's father, with an intent to inflict the same pain he endured when his father was killed by Arthur. Despite the destruction of Arthur's childhood home, the advanced medical technology of Atlantis thwarts Kane's plans, saving Tom. Now, with Jr. in Kane's clutches, things get real intense for Arthur and the gang in Atlantis. They hatch a plan to take down Kane and his army, pulling in some whale sonar magic to disarm his tech that has been causing them headaches. As they all prepare for the fight, Nereus is not quite ready to hand Orm a legit weapon. Instead, he hands him an axe, signaling that the rest of Atlantis still have some trust issues with Orm, even though he has proven himself to Arthur. As they gear up for the big face-off, Atlanta steps in, delivering a heart-to-heart -to, -heart to her sons and practically begs them to look out for each other before heading into the showdown with Kane. The last showdown is what makes Aquaman The Lost Kingdom a true DCU edition. As Kane reaches the Lost Kingdom of Necris with Dr. Shin and Arthur's baby son, things hit a boiling point in the throne room. Kane's twisted plan involves sacrificing Junior in order to break the blood magic binding the King of Necris. However, Dr. Shin, whose true motivations were hinted at throughout the film, decides to throw a curveball. It turns out he was only in cahoots with Kane to get a glimpse of Atlantis himself, so when Kane demands Jr., Dr. Shin hands him an explosive instead, but Kane quickly takes control, knocking Dr. Shin and seizing the baby. Amidst this chaos, Nereus gets tangled up with one of the necrotic creatures lurking in the Necris. For a moment, it looks like he might not make it, as Orm appears to peer down at him with a rather sinister smirk. Yet, Orm surprises everyone by using his axe to rescue Nereus from the clutches of the monstrous creature. In gratitude, Nereus finally entrusts Orm with a real weapon to face the undead adversaries they were confronting. Just in the nick of time, Arthur, Orm, and Mira arrive at the throne room gates after receiving a frantic message from Arthur's son who was at the brink of getting sacrificed as Kate is all set to commit the horrific act on the altar with Junior. In a heated confrontation, Arthur and Orm face off against the empowered Kane who holds a significant advantage, given that he was imbued with the dark powers of Kordax's Black Trident. While the brothers keep Kane occupied, Mira swoops in to rescue her son, preventing any harm to the baby amidst the raging battle. As Mira strives to run with Junior, Black Manta hurls the Black Trident her way. In a clutch move, Orm swoops in, seizing the Trident in midair, and urges Mira to flee. But while holding the Black Trident with both hands, Orm is suddenly hit by its full power as the King of Necris transfers from Kane to someone who supposedly harbors even more hatred for Aquaman. However, this claim does not exactly hold water, at least not anymore, and we will get to that. Amidst this chaos, Orm, now imbued with Kordax's powers, unleashes his fury on Arthur, tossing him around while Arthur does his best to stop him. But Orm splits him onto the altar, where Arthur's blood breaks the spell that has restrained the king for centuries. Next, we know, a fierce struggle ensues between Arthur and Orm over the Black Trident. But despite this intense conflict, Arthur appeals to the history they share, emphasizing that he has never harbored any animosity towards Orm. Right from the start, Arthur aimed to let Orm know that he was never alone. In a poignant moment, Arthur implores Orm to release the Trident as he reminds him of what their mother had pleaded with them and then urges him to join forces in vanquishing their common foe once and for all. With their mother's words echoing in their minds urging them to look out for each other, Orm heeds the emotional plea and finally releases the trident. Arthur seizes this moment to hurl the trident at the king of Necris, who has now risen. Despite the ancient evil king's resilience, Arthur, thinking on his feet, uses his own trident to shatter the black trident, ultimately defeating the king of Necris. But the destruction of the king initiates the collapse of the magic holding the fallen kingdom 
of Necros together, creating a new threat that our heroes must navigate to escape. In a surprising turn of events, despite the long-standing animosity between Arthur and Kane, spanning two movies, Arthur attempts to save Kane's life as he clings to the side of a precipice. However, Kane is not exactly the one to embrace redemption and hence chooses to let go and plummet into the rocky abyss below. While Arthur's compassionate nature prompts him to extend a helping hand, Kane's unwillingness to accept it marks a decisive and tragic end to his character. And if this was not the last film in the DCEU, Kane's death would prove to become a prime real estate in case the franchise wanted to veer towards a to-be-continued scenario, but it seems like that this time David Kane is dead for good. After narrowly escaping the collapse of the Lost Kingdom, Arthur, Mira, Orm, Nereus, and Dr. Shin regroup back on the surface to assess the aftermath. This is when Arthur expresses to Orm that, in his eyes, the debt has been repaid, hinting that there is absolutely no need for Orm to take the sacrificial route to turn himself in. Surprisingly, both Arthur and Mira chooses to turn a blind eye to Orm's escape, allowing him the chance to live his life outside of prison. This gesture catches Orm off guard and the trio shares a poignant moment, reflecting the evolution of their relationships throughout the film. It is a far cry from Orm's earlier reluctance to accept Arthur's hand as in a heartwarming brotherly exchange, Orm goes as far as acknowledging Arthur as the king that the Lattice truly deserves, praising his unwavering commitment to doing what's right, no matter the difficulty. The ending reveals the kingdom of Atlantis to the world above. From the film's outset, one of the key conflicts in Arthur's reign was his belief in Atlantis revealing itself to the world. With the escalating threat of climate change exacerbated by Kane's malicious schemes, it appears that Arthur has successfully swayed the council to disclose their hidden nation to the world by the film's end. As Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom concludes, a montage unfolds featuring news broadcasts reporting on this revelation to the world. The iconic moment arrives when Arthur, along with other key figures, from Atlantis surfaces to meet with the United Nations. Now, the global impact of this disclosure is evident as people worldwide flock to their television screens to witness the grand unveiling, including the enthusiastic Dr. Shin, who finds the whole spectacle outstanding. The sequence climaxes with Arthur addressing the public and the United Nations at Ellis Island, showcasing his regal yet laid-back demeanor in delivering a speech to the world. It should be taken into account that this particular sequence stays focused on the core cast of the sequel, foregoing potential cameos to maintain the spotlight on concluding Arthur's narrative. This really is a fitting end to a tale that revolves around Arthur's personal journey and evolution in the Aquaman franchise. The post credit scene ends DCEU on a hopeful note. In an uncanny departure from the usual DCU trend of setting up the next big threat or leaving the audience with cliffhangers, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom provides its cast of characters with a heartfelt and gentle send-off. The film portrays the rebuilding of Arthur's childhood home in the intervening months, showcasing a moment of happiness. This sequence captures the essence of a typical day, highlighting the joy in Tom and Atlanta's cozy reunion, Arthur and Tom performing a haka for Junior, and a heartwarming interactions between Junior and his canine companion, all of which contributes to the overall sense of contentment, plus Mira and Arthur also appear blissfully content in watching their family rebuild together. Now, the film did not shy away from addressing Orm's persistent disdain for the surface world. Arthur still attempted to broaden Orm's perspective by tempting him with the virtues of earthly delights such as hamburgers, beers, and tacos. The film cleverly uses humor to depict Orm's gradual softening towards the surface world, especially after tasting a cockroach, which Arthur had introduced to him as the shrimp of the land. In the credits scene, we see Orm finally enjoying the burger and beer on a surface level, but with the surprising addition of a cockroach. He crushes it into his burger and takes a big bite, grinning from ear to ear. This is a funny twist that not only shows Orm's changing perspective, but also hints at the end of this chapter in Aquaman's story. The scene not only humorously references Orm's evolving taste, but also symbolizes his willingness to reconsider prejudices and find beauty in the surface world. Unlike the usual usual DCU credit scenes that drop hints about the next adventure, this one wraps things up with humor and a sense of closure. It felt like a cheerful goodbye to this version of Aquaman, leaving us with a smile with a tint of grossness from the bug-filled burger. Whether it was part of a grand plan from the start or some clever last-minute adjustments, James Wan made sure that Arthur Curry got one heck of a set-off, making him the only character in the DCEU to bow out in style and carve his place into DCEU history.
What is the future of this franchise? Back in October 2023, director James Gunn and Peter Safran took on the roles of co-chairs and co-chief executive officers at DC Studios, becoming the designated creative minds steering the ship for superhero storytelling. Their appointment marked the beginning of a significant overhaul in the cinematic universe, unveiling a fresh slate of projects, but this new lineup unfortunately did not include the existing versions of familiar heroes like Aquaman, Shazam, and The Flash. Plus, the subsequent performance of the Shazam sequel and The Flash standalone were both considered box office disappointments, adding uncertainty about the future appearances of these characters. Now, Aquaman 2's credit scene with its humorous tone in the film's neatly wrapped up conclusion definitely doesn't hint at Aquaman's next grand adventure, unless of course it involves a burger date with his brother Orm. The ending's implications for the status of the DCEU and the upcoming DCU remains frustratingly unclear. Plus, the lack of clarity on how the franchise will transition into the DCU has been a recurring issue in the 2023 DCEU films, further complicated by the fact that major Justice League characters are portrayed by the same DCEU actors as of the film's endings, particularly evident in The Flash, but a straightforward interpretation suggests that Aquaman 2's conclusion may not influence either franchise significantly. In terms of the DCEU, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom appears to have wrapped up the franchise, while in Gunn's DCU, the announcement of recasting all DCEU Justice League members hint towards a different direction for Aquaman. Aquaman's narrative. Consequently, Aquaman 2's ending may not exactly impact the DCU's future unless Gunn and Peter Safran decide to incorporate Jason Momoa's version of the character, which seems improbable given that the actor has allegedly mentioned that this was his last time taking up the Aquaman mantle. Despite its limited impact on the DCU, Aquaman 2's ending carries a deeper thematic meaning. The film's central theme revolves around building bridges, from Arthur's evolving relationship with Orm to Atlantis establishing connections with the surface world, the ending encapsulates how the idea of forging connections and building bridges can actually bring mutual benefits. It adds a bittersweet touch as the outcomes of these relationships won't be further explored, yet it aptly somehow serves as a bridge between the DCEU and James Gunn's revamped DCU. What is our verdict on Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom? Just like the first Aquaman flick, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom seems to be all about giving Arthur and his sidekick an excuse to go on a global joyride. This time, it is Orm riding shotgun instead of Mira, making it a buddy adventure with a splash of worldwide exploration. Director James Wan throws in some moments to showcase his horror chops, giving us a taste of what could have been if he actually went full throttle on his spooky superhero vibes. But let's be real, most of the time, Aquaman and Orm are hopping around from place to place for reasons so wild you'll probably forget even them. Who needs a solid plot when you have got dazzling action scenes stealing the show? To be honest, it is a bit of a wild ride and not always in a good way. And let's talk about the script by David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick. It's trying too hard to walk the tightrope between serious and silly, but sometimes it wobbles a bit too much. I mean, they throw around the world Orichalcum like it's the most serious thing in the world, and I could not help but find it hilariously overused. Plus, Jason Momoa seems to be channeling his inner Momoa, or maybe it's just him being his awesome self, especially in the first act. It's like he's on screen doing a Momoa impression for better or worse. Now, we've seen him pull off a ramped up version of himself in fast acts, and it totally worked for the villain role, but even the dialed down Momoa charm can't carry an entire movie on its back. It definitely was a valiant effort on his part, but hey, we can't all be the one man shows. On the flip side, Patrick Wilson's Orm is the unsung hero here. He's like the perfect straight man to Momoa's antiques, and their dynamic is just gold. Wilson brings a subtle commitment to the ridiculousness, making even the wackiest jokes land. Plus, he surprisingly even fits right into the superhero action scenes. Even the supporting cast does a solid job holding their own. Tamara Morrison as Arthur's dad brings that serious dad energy and delivers the gravitas the role needs. Amber Heard returns as Mira with a smaller role, but still somehow manages to kick butt, especially in the final stretch. Yahya Abdul-Mateen II as the villain Black Manta is decent, but like many superhero baddies, he is a bit one-dimensional, and then there's Randall Park, bringing the laughs as Dr. Stephen Shin, adding that much-needed touch of levity, even if he doesn't get a ton of screen time. But let's be real, it was most definitely Momoa and Wilson stealing the spotlight. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom might not be winning any awards for its thin plot and occasional eye-rolling moments, but it still is a blast of superhero fun. The pace is like a speedster on Red Bull, but just fast enough to keep you from checking your watch, but not exactly a cinematic masterpiece you'll remember for years. 
may be the plot bit into more themes than it could swallow, and about it being the so-called conclusion of the DCEU, it really feels more like the last episode of a series that got cancelled out of the blue and has been rushed to its ending. So if you were already hooked in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, sure, dive in and enjoy, but it is totally acceptable to give this final DCEU hurrah a miss, especially with James Gunn and Peter Safran's DC Universe redo on the horizon. How about you guys? What do you guys think of this film? Do you guys share the same predicament? Leave your insights in the comment box below. If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.